Welcome to our midweek meeting today at Newtown Evangelical Church. Now, now and again as a church, we do in our midweek meetings, we do character studies, uh, looking at a certain person in history to, to learn from them, learn from their faults, learn from their mistakes, but also from their, their godliness. Um, so we look at people from scripture, we've looked at people from church his history, we've looked at people who are missionaries. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're looking at the life of Scottish missionary John Patton. Now, firstly, I just want to make it clear at the very beginning, I'm not suggesting in any way that I'm an expert in looking at the life and the ministry of John Patton. Um, I've read perhaps only from a couple of books on his life, um, and I'm aware many listening to this uh, across the internet or perhaps in our own local congregation, you know far more about John Patton than I do. Um, but what I do want to do is just share what struck me looking at his, his life, what really encouraged me, what really challenged me about Patton's life. Um, if you do want to find out more after this, um, then please do get in touch with me, um, email, call up the church. I'll be happy to point you in the direction of some really good books about him. Um, and as I say, many of you will know more about this man uh, than I do. I'm also aware that many of you listening to this uh, perhaps have never heard of the name John Patton or know anything about him. So throughout this time, my comments on John Patton are actually going to be quite limited. Um, in that sense, you're going to be hearing from John Patton's own words about what happened in his life uh, more than mine. And much of what we know from John Patton comes from his own autobiography. And the first thing to say is, John Patton wasn't perfect. He had faults, he had failings, um, he was a sinner. But most importantly, he was saved and he was greatly used by God. Uh, so he was a Scottish missionary to what is now known as Vanuatu, um, which is not too far from Australia. And back in Patton's day, it was known as the New Hebrides. And it wasn't until 1606 when Spanish explorers found this collection of 80 islands and uh, the people living there had been completely unknown to the rest of the world. But then it wasn't until 230 years later, uh, two London missionaries uh, landed on the shores there of these islands um, to reach the unreached with the gospel. But shortly after arriving ashore, they were killed after a matter of minutes and they were eaten by cannibals. And it was in that context that John Patton and his wife Mary um, set sail for these islands in 1858. And there's just a few points now that I want to look at Patton's life and ministry, what I think we can learn from today in our difficult days today, what I think we can really take as an example from his life. And the first thing I want to look at actually, actually doesn't really point to his mission work, but it looks at his childhood. And the first point I want to look at is that pattern that he was a prayed for man, that people prayed for him. Uh, pattern himself praises the influence and the prayerfulness of his own parents, particularly his father. And the prayerfulness and the example of his father reminds us of our responsibility, of our own example, of our prayerfulness to our own children and to the children in church. And it reminds us that none, absolutely none of our prayers are wasted. Uh, once, God willing, we go back to normal, we will still continue to have two prayer meetings a week for the lost. And uh, looking at John Patton's father, it gives us a real encouragement just to keep on praying. Perhaps only in eternity will we really find out the, the, the true impact of his father's prayers. Perhaps only in eternity will we see the true impact of our prayers for our children in church. But for Patton, growing up in his house, uh, there was a small room in the house where it was known that his father would go to pray after each mealtime. And Patton, he was the, John Patton, he was the eldest of 11 children, putting some of the families in church to shame. Um, but each of the children in the house knew that their father would go into this room to pray. Um, and that in itself taught them something profound about God. It taught them something about their father's absolute devotion to prayer. And the impact that this had on Patton, even at that young age, was, was immense. Um, this is what Patton says about his father. 
How much my father's prayers at this time impress me, I can never explain, nor any stranger understands. When on his knees and all of us kneeling around him in family worship, he would pour out his whole soul with tears for the conversion of the heathen world to the service of Jesus and for every personal and domestic need. We all felt as if in the presence of the living Saviour and learnt to know and love him as our divine friend. And what an example that is. And one of the clearest signs that we see of the relationship between John Patton and his father um, was when he was leaving the home to go and work in Glasgow as a city missionary. And his father walked with him part of the way um, to the train station. And Patton describes that train, um, sorry, Patton describes that scene uh, like this. He, he says this, My dear father walked with me the first six miles of the way. His counsel and tears and heavenly conversations on that parting journey are as fresh in my heart as if it had been yesterday. And the tears are on my cheeks freely now as then, whenever memory steals me away to the scene. For the last half mile or so, we walked on together in almost unbroken silence. His lips kept, lips kept moving in silent prayers for me. His tears fell fast when we met our eye, when our eyes met in each other's looks, which in all speech was in vain. We halted on reaching the appointed parting place. He grasped my hand firmly for a minute in silence, and then solemnly and affectionately said, "God bless you, my son. God prosper you, and keep you from all evil." Unable to say more, his lips kept moving in silent prayer. In tears we embraced and parted. I ran as fast as I could and when, turn, and when about to turn a corner in the road when he would lose sight of me. I looked back and saw him with his head uncovered where I had left him, gazing after me. I think it's clear to see just from that, the relationship this father and son had with one another. And I think what's clear from reading him is that their relationship was focused on a prayerful relationship with God. And f writing 40 years after that scene, writing 40 years after that moment, he writes about his father and mother. He says, I vow deeply and often by the help of God to live and act as so as to never grieve and all dishonour such a father and mother he had given me. As parents, as an example to children in church, we can try and achieve many things, we can try and focus on many things, but for me personally, looking at Patton's father, that's the kind of dad that I want to be. Uh, he was a Christ-centred father and therefore he prayed for his son. Uh, when Patton left the ministry there in Glasgow, uh, in the city there, he wanted to go out and reach the unreached with the gospel. And Patton and his wife came under huge criticism for that decision. The ministry in Glasgow was successful. Why would he want to go further afield? But Patton's parents fully supported him. And they wrote him a letter saying this. When you were given to us, your father and mother laid you upon the altar, their firstborn to be consecrated, if God saw fit, as a missionary of the cross. And it has been their constant prayer that you might be prepared, qualified and led to this very decision. And we pray with all our hearts that the Lord may accept your offering, long spare you and give, and give you many souls from the heathen world for your hire. If we're wondering whether the prayers of his parents were answered, Patton went to the unreached Hebrides and it is thought that today, over a hundred years after Patton's death, that Vanuatu is now about 92% identifying as Christian and 41% of the population are evangelical. We must never underestimate the power of our praying. The praying for our children, the praying for the children in church. 
Only eternity might show the consequences of our praying. This, I'm aware this time isn't on Spurgeon, but it doesn't take me much to quote Spurgeon. And Spurgeon says on, on mothers and prayer, he says, The devil never reckons a man to be lost so long he has, as he has a good mother praying for him. O oh, woman, great is your power. John Patton, he was a prayed for man. But as he went out on the mission field, second point is he was a courageous man. He was a courageous man. And as we just heard with nearly the entire population identifying as Christian, just because Patton had a successful ministry doesn't mean it was an easy ministry. Uh, Life was extremely difficult for Patton. And despite that, he stayed on the island there, difficult year after difficult year after difficult year. And why? It's clear from his writings that he knew God was sovereign in the good times and in the bad times. As I mentioned, he he faced huge criticism for leaving the um, ministry in the city there in Glasgow um, to leave for these cannibal islands. And one of the leaders in the church, and this, this quote's quite famous, one of the leaders in the church called Mr Dixon said to him, the cannibals, you'll be eaten by cannibals. And Patton's famous reply was, Mr Dixon, you are advanced in years now and your prospect is to be soon laid in the grave and there to be eaten by worms. I confess to you that if I live and die serving and honouring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or by worms. And in the great day of my resurrection body, it will rise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. So he left with his wife and they arrived on the islands 5th of November 1858 and his wife Mary was pregnant. The baby was born the following year, 1859 on the 12th of February and he said, our island exile thrilled with joy. But that joy was short lived, that joy soon turned to sorrow. And on the islands he said this, Then in a moment, unexpectedly, altogether unexpectedly, she, talking about his wife, died. To crown my sorrows and complete my loneliness, the dear baby boy, who we named after her father, was taken from me after one week of sickness. Let those who have ever passed through any similar darkness as of midnight feel for me. So there, picture it now all alone on these islands, this difficult mission ahead of him, the strength and the courage to carry on in this mission work had to come from outside of himself, in God's. And Patton knew that. He knew that. He said, I felt her loss beyond all conception or description in that dark land. It was very difficult to be resigned, left alone and in sorrowful circumstances but feeling immovably assured that my God and Father was too wise and loving to error in anything he does or permits, I looked up to the Lord for help and struggled on in his work. And Patton nearly died several times through sickness himself. A few years after his wife Mary passed away, he remarried, um, and altogether four out of his ten children passed away. And Patton knew better than most, didn't he? The words of Job 1.21. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And what I love about Patton, he doesn't, he doesn't pretend he didn't struggle. He knew he did. And so when you read about Patton's life, which I encourage you to do, it kind of sounds like a blockbuster, blockbuster thriller. It seems to move from one crisis to another. Uh, and from the, aside from the illness and the sickness... There was the regular threats of what he calls the savages and the cannibals. And he remembers a number of occasions uh, when his house was surrounded by different tribes, um, stories of ambush while trying to tell people the gospel. He said this, Our continuous danger caused me now oftentimes to sleep with my clothes on, that I might start at a moment's warning. My faithful dog would give a sharp bark and awaken me. 
God made them fear this precious creature and often used her in saving our lives. That God even used the dog um, to protect them. But amazingly enough, Patton spoke to these different tribes with real courage. He often rebuked them for trying to kill him. He would tell them off to their face, even when they held an axe to his face. And it was because he knew he was 100% secure in Christ that it gave him this boldness, this courage. He knew Matthew 10, 28, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And Patton said this himself. He said, I realised I was immortal till my master's work with me was done. The assurance came to me as if a voice from heaven had spoken that not a musket would be fired to wound us, not a club prevail to strike us, not a spear leave the hand in which it was held to be thrown, not an arrow leave the bow or a killing stone in the fingers without the permission of Jesus Christ, whose is all the power in heaven and earth. Whether being chased through the forest or ambushed, his house being surrounded, it gave him huge confidence to know what we looked at on Sunday. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, and we see the whole list there, nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Patton said to them himself when he was confronted with these tribes, he said, I assured them that I was not afraid to die. For at death my Saviour would take me to be with himself in heaven and I to be far happier than I had ever been on earth. Then I lifted up my hands and my eyes to heaven and prayed aloud for Jesus, either to protect me or to take me home to glory, whatever he thought best. There are so, so, so many other stories that we could say uh, throughout this time. But just out of the interest of time, we'll f move on to our final encouragement from Patton. And what I think is perhaps the most important encouragement. He, thirdly, he was a man who had a deep fellowship with Jesus. And we need that today, a deep fellowship with Jesus. I mentioned before... That his wife and his child um, died on the island and he was very much alone throughout this time. Uh, we're told that um, in his loneliness he had uh, dug two graves by hand and buried them next to the house that he'd built. And he stayed by these graves night after night to protect them from the, the local cannibals. And by these gravesides he said this, stunned by that dreadful loss. In entering upon this field of labour to which the Lord himself has so evidently led me, my reason seemed for a time almost to give way, but the ever merciful Lord sustained me. During all the following months and years when I laboured on for the salvation of the savage islanders amidst difficulties, dangers and deaths, but for Jesus and the fellowship that he gave me there, I must have gone mad and died beside the lonely graves. It was Jesus that was his main and most important source of fellowship. It's not a surprise to hear that one of Patton's most treasured verses for himself was the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Therefore go make disciples of all nations, and later on, and surely I am with you always, the very end of the age. Those verses tell us the, the importance to preach Christ where he is not yet known, but also the great promise, the great hope for Patton that he was not in this work alone, that in all the dangers, Jesus was with him. And Patton says himself, Once, when natives in large numbers were assembled at my house, a man furiously rushed on me with his axe, but a chief snatched a spade from which I had been working and bravely defended me from instant death. Life in such circumstances led me to cling very near to the Lord Jesus. I knew not for one brief hour when or how an attack might be made. 
and yet with my trembling hand gripped in the hand once nailed on Calvary. You kind of have to ask, why did Patton stay there? Why couldn't you return to the Scotland with the, the sex, successful ministry there? And it's because he had such a huge burden for souls and for those who were lost, who had not heard of the name of Jesus. He said this, Let me record my immovable conviction that this is the noblest service in which any human being can spend or be spent. And that if God gave me back my life to be lived over again, I would without quiver or hesitation lay it on the altar of Christ, that he might use it as before in similar ministries of love, especially amongst those who have never yet heard of the name of Jesus. That's quite a thing to say from someone who had known such loss and had known such frequent danger. And it seems sometimes perhaps one fault, if you could say that from Patton, would be that he didn't quite see sometimes um, that ev not everyone had the same burden and passion for the lost that he passionately did. And he said that looking back at the church in the UK, and perhaps this can be said now, he said, my heart often says within itself, when, when will men's eyes at home be opened? When will the rich and the learned renounce their shallow ways and go out amongst the poor, the ignorant, the outcast and the lost and write their eternal fame on the souls brought to the Saviour? Those who have tasted this highest joy, the joy of the Lord, will never ask again, is life worth living? As I mentioned, there's, there's far more to Patton's life than what we've just mentioned here in the last few minutes. Um, but I've just mentioned some of the things that have just struck me. That I was encouraged and challenged by the example and the prayerfulness of a father. I was encouraged and challenged by a man who held the deep truths about God, even in difficult circumstances. I was encouraged and challenged by a man who was courageous. I was encouraged and challenged by a man who was flawed but faithful and who had this deep, deep fellowship with Jesus. I'll finish with one more story which kind of shows us all these points in just this one story. It shows us prayerfulness, it shows us courage, it shows us a deep fellowship with Jesus. And yet again, Patton had been ambushed and chased by these savages throughout the woods. And he says this, I climbed into the tree and was left there alone in the bush. The hours I spent there lived before me as if it were yesterday. I heard the frequent discharging of muskets and the yells of the savages. Yet I sat there amongst the branches, safe as in the arms of Jesus. Never in all my sorrows did my Lord draw nearer to me and speak more soothingly to my soul. The night air played on my throbbing brow as I told all my heart to Jesus. Alone, yet not alone. If it be to glorify my God, I will not grudge to spend many a night in such a tree, to feel again my Saviour's spiritual presence, to enjoy his consoling fellowship. And this is the challenge to us. If you are thrown back upon your own soul, alone, all alone, in the midnight, in the bush, in the very embrace of death itself, have you a friend that will not fail you then? I won't add any more to that, but I'll just finish this time now with prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the life of John Patton. Lord, we thank you for the words of Matthew chapter 10. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Lord, we thank you that John Patton found his life in Christ. Lord, we thank you for his life, that he was far from perfect, but Lord, we thank you that you saved him. We thank you for the prayers of a faithful father and mother. We pray for our children, 
We pray for our example to them. We pray for our prayerfulness of them. And Lord, we do pray for such a courageous faith in our days, for such a deep fellowship with you in these difficult times. And Lord, we do pray that we would have that same burden from the lost, for the lost that Patton did. And Patton, who said, O oh Jesus, to you alone be the glory. You have the key to unlock every heart that you have created. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.